So in this arrangement, the first note of the melody begins below the accompaniment. And the accompaniment follows there in the middle between the two outside notes of the melody. Of course, pedal is implied, even though those are staccato accompaniment notes, it's not important to hear them as staccato, because this sound is absolutely fine. What's more important is to realize that the accompaniment has to be very light, otherwise it's a little bit hard to hear this melody. Right, if all we needed to play was this, our problem is basically solved. Um, but because of the accompaniment notes, we need to practice this idea of balance within the hand. So the first note, nice and clear, mezzo forte, right? The accompaniment note, or the interval, on B2, definitely a piano or even a pianissimo. So just practicing that is important, to get used to this idea of a loud beginning and a very soft uh, bounce of the accompaniment. Right, so if you can do this, then the third beat presents the main challenge of this arrangement. You have to play the top note pretty loudly, another mezzo forte, maybe forte, if you feel particularly drunk on with this song, um, or just happy, and still have to play those bottom two notes pretty quietly. Hmm. Well, I've talked about this practice approach before and I'll uh, mention it again. If you can play this G flat by itself with this kind of finger angle, allowing us to rest our th second and third fingers on the B flat and D flat keys, that already solves a lot of the problem. Now, I'm not trying to play second and third fingers at all. I'm just resting them. Right? But being able to do it in this position, at this angle, is a very important first skill. Now, also, let's make sure we can play two and three very quietly. And the way I do it, I just kind of brush the keys. I don't move, notice I don't do any bouncing. I don't worry about those staccato dots particularly, I just want to go in and out very lightly. So that, and then there is that. Recognize you can do those two parts separately first, because if you can't, it's, it take, it's a good idea to not worry about anything else and just get comfortable with these muscular contractions. Right, different muscles involved, fifth finger muscles, second and third finger muscles, while the position is absolutely calm and steady. Right, that's all you want to do before you deal with the rest of B3. Now, I can actually play this whole measure in this position. I don't need to move my hand at all. But if you find that your hand is a little smaller, maybe you will need to do something like this. Slight adjustment. Maybe play, you know, the, the uh, fifth finger more inside to minimize this stretch. What's most important is that your thumb does not do this. Right? So whatever you do, keep the thumb gliding along this black-white borderline. Okay. Right. As long as you can do this as much as possible, keep the thumb point in this way, because in measure four we need to find the D-flat. So that's about the position. But what about beat three? the practice of playing it together like this as opposed to right where you feel very where you just play all notes very strongly and as the result um, the accompaniment notes bury the melody a little bit well I would say if you can do that meaning you can do each part 
just fine. It's bringing it together that creates tension in the hand and lack of control uh, as far as dynamic control for each of those fingers. Let's do it gradually. Right? You're holding this G flat and now you add fingers two and three while holding the G flat. It's a slightly different feeling than if you just simply play this, let go, and then play fingers two and three. You now have to actively uh, pay attention to the holding muscles of finger five, right? While also articulating quietly fingers two and three. So if, as long as you can do it separately, play finger five, and then afterwards add fingers two and three, now you're another 25% uh, towards the goal. Because the difference in time between me playing the G flat with finger five and then playing afterwards staccato in fingers two and three can be gradually eliminated. Right? Until you're basically playing it together, but you have the same control as if you're playing it separated by time. So that's how I would approach it. I wouldn't worry about playing it together right away, but instead. Focus on playing the fifth finger uh, uh, by itself first, and then almost like there is a 16th or 32nd note rest underneath the G flat, and then you play that staccato third beat, fingers two and three, quickly afterwards. Right? S same thing here, by the way. Five is strong, but the one on D flat in measure two is weak, right? Also, I would encourage you to as much as possible angle fingers two and four towards B flat and D flat, right? And same thing occurs there. You don't want to play those notes with the same dynamic. It'll sound a little bit heavy. I mean, I think you can still recognize the melody is there, but it definitely doesn't sound as appealing. That's the sing singable line, and the, the rest is just accompaniment. There are different ways to finger it. I said put finger four there, I didn't write it down, and I probably should have. Because then you move finger four from D flat down to C flat. So those are the kind of details that you might want to put into your own score. But the important part is again, once you figure out the position, once you figure out the fingerings that you're using, just take some time to do this. Right, so play the melody note first, concentrate, think about playing the accompaniment note quietly, and then do that. And then second beat. Right? You're always thinking, how do I play this strongly and how do I play this weakly? And then last beat. As soon as you play that G flat, that's when you move, right? Because that's what you would be doing in performance. And then reposition again. In measure five, the beginning is exactly the same as measures one and two, so that's good. I think measures seven and eight are even easier than 
measures uh, three and four. It's a perfect opportunity to work on playing the, those accompaniment notes very, very quietly. Play the D flat and measure seven, then add the accompaniment after, af afterwards once you have had the chance to refocus on playing quietly. Now here, I think it will be easier if you wait to prepare the D flat. Again, I'm a big proponent of advanced preparation, but here you're working within a chordal position. And this position stays constant until the end of the seventh measure. And then that's when you change. You notice what happens. First fingers two plays on A flat here. But then when I do this rotation or deviation or whatever, finger two glides down the A flat pretty deep inside. So that's a very different way of playing the same finger on the same key. Look at the angle, look where on the key I am. Okay, now in measure nine we get to the new material. Same thing applies. Find the position and now just practice like this. Add quietly, then second beat. Add the accompaniment quietly. Again. So you might almost practice it as if the accompaniment notes are shifted by an eighth note, right? So you're almost practicing like this. And so on, right? So I'm literally, instead of having this homophonic texture, I could have this kind of texture. Something like this. So um, I didn't, I decided not to arrange it like this. I could have, but I wanted to instead have a more traditional waltz feel to this arrangement. So. I created this problem for us to solve, but you solve it by practicing as if it was written differently. I sp just split those accompaniment notes and the melody notes in time. But all this, the problems of changing positions and knowing exactly how to glide down the keyboard still apply and again mostly you will be playing the thumb on the black white border at all times even if you play the the uh, white key because playing like this is just not very efficient this uh, g flat key allows first of all for a very warm sound but it also allows for some stretches that are a little easier for instance much easier to play e flat to g flat tenth then it would be to, let's say, play D to F 10th. You kind of feel a little more intrusion from the neighboring um, white keys. Whereas here, look, we have this nice big gaps. And so I, I like the G flat key for this reason. Anyway, uh, let's continue to measure 13. Again, let's just play it like I, I think you should practice it. Here, after measure, last beat of measure 13, big preparation shift, uh, big position shift. Here is our first position in measure 13. But then as soon as you play the last note of measure 13, that's the new position, right? Kind of A flat dominant seventh chord there. And then the preparation before measure 15 is, of course, for um, beats one and two. You cannot prepare the last uh, last beat with the thumb on G flat, so that's okay. But now, shift the thumb down. And then a 
big, big shift there before measure 16. I'm preparing the D flat, the F, of course, also C flat, and probably A flat. So probably the entirety of measure uh, 16, unless you find your hand is a little bit smaller and therefore it struggles to put all its fingers on the, these keys, but the, the fingers should be close by. Just separating in time like this, measure 17, and we're back to the beginning. Again, I should have put down, um, I think, a fourth finger there for B2 of measure 18, just like for B2 of measure 2. So, measure 17, 18, 19, 20, you see it's identical to measures 1, 2, 3, 4, 21. That's where we start to see change. As we approach the end of this song. Okay, here it's re reasonably simple. It's strong, weak, strong again. And as I do it, notice that what I'm trying to do with the thumb bringing it right over to F flat before I even play the third beat with finger four. Now here it's this interesting four over, th uh, sorry, three over four motion. So four is on A flat and I'm moving the third finger and the second finger across and now I would do separating in time thing, so uh, measure 22. I would hold my fingers 1 and 2 all the way to the end of measure 22, in case you want to clear the pedal and not lose the, uh, the accompaniment. Right, just like that. And now, as, you, as soon as... As soon as you hit the last no melody note of measure 22, reposition for 23 like this. Yeah? And let's do the pr uh, practice with uh, separating in time. E flat strong, thumb quietly. And as soon as you play that slurred pair, reposition for 1, 2 like this. Now here, coming up. I'm preparing everything before I play that three in measure 24. I prepare the two G flats. I prepare the second finger on the C flat. The only thing that I'll have to change is going to be the fourth finger. I'm going to bring it back to E flat in measure 25, but be in this position before the second beat of measure 24. And again, separating in time. Now, as soon as I play the third beat of 25, again, I want to do this move, look. All right, so hop over the B flat hump, bump, right? big stretch. Um, hopefully your hand can do it. But keep, keep working on this dynamic separation. Strong melody notes and quiet accompaniment notes right away. Don't go for speed, go for precision and um, control. seven coming up um, after the third beat of measure 26 yes you would want to prep yeah I don't know why I'm missing <laughs> 29 anyway sorry about this so just keep it out like this um, so in measure 27 we want to be in this position right Th the second finger is on B flat 
like this. So play 26 and practice doing that. Then in measure 27, slide it down with 5, 4, and then that move kind of pivots around the third finger, but then as well you shift down so the third finger pivot actually loses its anchor point as you reach the D-flat, D-flat octave and the third finger moves to B-flat, right? Something like this. Maybe not too much pivot, I slightly over-exaggerated. But what you do want is a very comfortable second on G-flat, deep inside the G-flat key. B-flat, third finger there, and second, fourth finger aiming towards the C. All right, so let's do it with uh, time separation for dynamic precision. my second finger to G flat, my fault. Do it again. Right, so before playing measure 28, that's how I want to, to position. And now measure 29, where you don't see the number, unfortunately. So this is 29, 30, 31, 32. Finger three should go here on E flat. So E flat, then add the A flat. Ah, uh, actually, my apologies. Not finger three, finger four. I really need to fix this addition with the new version, obviously. So finger four. I put it down. I don't know what happened. Okay, so finger four on E flat, one and two, and one on G flat, and now you prepare this FF15 position. If you can force yourself to do it, don't do this, right? Just play it like this, close to the black keys, to teach yourself to be able to do that. It's not that you're not allowed to move out of the keyboard. You are. But I think when it's only one note, one measure, it's more trouble than it's worth. And again, no, nobody is going to be hurt if you do it this way. But I always like to teach some advanced techniques in preparation for even harder pieces where it's essential to not do not not move out but always stay in sorry fourth finger but let's say your hand is really really small like it's hard for you to stretch an octave or a ninth yeah then you're probably in a better uh, spot to do this you kind of have to, to to play a clean octave in. But if your hand is bigger and you can stretch this comfortably, then just do that. Anyway, so hopefully this helped a little bit uh, and I hope you enjoy. Any questions, ask in the comments.